Hey everyone, it's Phil Wade. How are you tonight? Happy Tuesday. If you can say hello, let me know you can hear me, see me. We'll get going in just a minute. Type away. Let me know who's here. That would be great. Um, you know, we found that these trainings work the best when you participate, ask questions. So we will get going in just a moment. Thank you for being here. All right. Nobody's typing. So Right down in the box below, here's Peggy. She's typing something awesome. Hi, Peggy. Good to see you. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to move the slide and we're going to get going. All right, so last night we talked about working, you know, with a seller and then how to get your business going. So tonight it is the buyer side, like working with a buyer. So we're going to go through how to show a home, right? That is kind of the first step, you know, in the process of working you know, working with a buyer, show them, you know, several homes, you never know how many, till they actually want to make an offer. And we're going to talk a little bit about doing the comps, right? Um, you know, because typically, you know, before they submit an offer, um, you know, you're going to have to tell them, hey, this is kind of what things are going for. You know, certainly, um, you know, you would have been out and about checking out some homes, so you'd have a pretty good idea, you know, kind of what things, you know, represent value. Then we're going to talk a little bit about submitting an offer. It's not a full contract training. You know, Claren does that every other Monday, but we're going to go through, you know, the highlights. Then we're going to talk about the home inspection, negotiating the inspection, make sure we're on top of the key buyer dates. Uh, we have, you know, an acknowledgement uh, to let the buyers know how we're working with them. It's not an agreement. It's just a disclosure. You know, let them know what they're responsible for, what we're responsible for. Then we're going to chat a little bit about the, you know, the final walkthrough right before closing. That's a good thing, right? Property's about to close. You're about to earn your commission. Um, and then asking for reviews and referrals. So kind of beginning to end, all the way start to finish, you know, with that buyer. Hey, Maria, good to see you. Thank you for being here. Andres, I knew you would be here. Good to see you. Thank you so much. Again, you know, these trainings are for you, right? If you have any questions, just type them in the box. If you have any questions about anything, I'm happy to answer them for you. All right. So let's, uh, let's kind of move that slide again and we'll kind of get into it. All right. So some of this, if you've been an agent for a little bit, is going to be pretty basic. You know, if you're brand new, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, a little more, you know, knowledge, but pretty basic stuff, but just want to make sure we cover it all. So the first thing is setting up your schedule of showings, right? So every appointment, you know, needs to be confirmed. These are people's homes we're going into. So every particular one, um, you know, we have to have confirmation from the listing agent. There is no going in anybody's home without any con without confirmation, even if that property is vacant. It has to be confirmed. Your showing has to be confirmed, you know, by the listing agent. And then you have to be there. You have to be there for every showing. Right. You can't just give your client, you know, there's two types of lock boxes, right, which secure the properties. You know, one is an electronic lock box. Right. You got to have the, you know, the super key on your phone in order of the Bluetooth in order to, you know, get in. And then there are still, you know, people that use combination lock boxes. Right. Put the key in the combination lock box. So those aren't, you know, as secure. Um, you know, just had to let somebody go it's probably a few months ago now, but, you know, I got a call from his, their client, his client, and, um, you know, she was complaining, you know, not happy with the service, you know, and again, you know, what I've learned, there are two types of real estate agents out there. One, they want to do the least amount of work to get that commission, the least amount of work. And then, there's certainly a whole bunch that don't think that way, right? They're there to help. They do the right thing. So what ends up happening here, so the young lady calls me and, 
you know, was complaining about a few things. And I'm like, okay, let me let me talk with the agent. So there's two two groups, right? There are two groups. There's FREC, right? You know, there are laws around real estate agents, right? And those laws are administered by FREC, the Florida Real Estate Commission. You don't want to get called up in front of FREC. They can take your license away. They can put you on probation. You know, they can do a, bad, a bunch of bad things. And then the other group is the code of ethics, you know, that we adhere to as realtors, right? So those are the those are the two things where, you know, we got to know what those laws are. We got to know what the code of ethics are so we don't ever violate any. So anyway, so, you know, she calls, she complains. I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to get back to you. I need to speak to the agent. We talk to the agent. And again, it's kind of what I said. He did the least amount of work to get that commission. Just again, like this business, do not do that, right? The business is based on referrals, repeat clients. You know, in the beginning, that's difficult, right? But you want to impress the hell out of your clients, right? So they tell others. And if they need to, you know, maybe sell that house in the future, they're going to call you because you did a great job for them. A lot of times, not always, but sometimes, you know, we become friends with our clients. It happens. So I call them, I call her back and I'm like, hey, you know, I tell her there's FREC and there's the code of ethics. And based on speaking to the agent, it didn't seem like he violated any of those. Now, he didn't do the greatest job. I admit that. And I'm sorry for that. Then she goes, oh, there's one other thing. Oh, there's one other thing. Like, what's that? He gave me the lockbox code and told me to go on a company terminated, fired, gone, right? Can't, can't do that, right? Can't do that. So again, every showing confirmed, every showing you are there, you are present. All right. So again, you're going to bring a copy of the listing, right? The MLS listing with you. You're going to get there early, right? I mean, what I used to do, you know, my daughter, it's a little beaten up. My clipboard, right? I, you know, when I was out as an agent, I have my clipboard. I have all the listings, you know. And as I'm going to the properties, you know, I'm giving the client the listing sheet, and I'm showing them around. Get there early. Remember what we talked about last night. To succeed as a real estate agent, you have to find people you don't know. You have to find people you don't know and have them work with you. Okay, so it's the first meeting with you and a potential new client, and you're late. You're late. Again, can't do that. You want to get there early. You want to get that house opened up, right? You're winning their business. Not everybody we work with do we win their business, but you want to have a fairly high conversion rate. You know, did I have people that, you know, I took around numerous times and didn't end up buying anything from me. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's <laughs> you know, you're like, are they ever going to buy? Are they ever going to put an offer in? And I know if I dump them, they're going to hook up with another agent. And then they're going to make an offer. All my work down the drain. Again, buyers think we know everything about every house. And they might ask you questions about that house that you don't have the answer for. Never, ever shoot from the hip. Never lie. You know, I remember when I first started in real estate, there was an old timer. Now I'm the old timer, right? And he said, being a real estate agent is about answering questions. You know, I was very brand new and it kind of like, oh, what do you mean? And now that I've been doing this a while, absolutely. Nobody is plunking down 500,000, 750,000, a million dollars without asking some questions about that house. So our job is to answer those questions. Now, again, sometimes we might not know the answer. Hey, I'm not sure. Let me get back to you. I need to speak to the listing agent, right? And then you go from there. Pretty basic, pretty standard, but kind of worth mentioning. All right. Bullet three. Bullet three. Point out the bad. Gain trust of buyer. This is 
counterintuitive, but it works. You know, when you're the buyer's agent, you're called the selling agent. That's the listing agent, and then there's the selling agent, the agent that sold the house. All right. There is no selling anybody a house. It doesn't work like that. They have to want to buy it. You're trying to help them through a difficult and sometimes long process. They are relying on you for your expertise. You know, I had an agent, you know, take this training. It's a few years ago, but it stuck with me, right? And, you know, he went out and when he was purchasing a home and he typed in, you know, the agent took me around, showed me three houses and said, which house do you want to make an offer on? Fired, dumped, pushy, aggressive, only cares about the commission. That's that's not how to do this, guys. Right? You're there consulting. You're there helping. All right. Point out the bad. <laughs> Gain trust of buyer. What is he talking about? So who knows, right? So you take them around, you show them some houses, and they want to make an offer. You'll do some comps. We're going to talk about that shortly. And then, you know, you write up the offer and, and it gets accepted. It gets accepted. Then the client has to make their escrow deposit. Who knows what comes next? What comes next? So you have an accepted offer, right? They've made their escrow. And what comes next on the road to closing? Who, who knows? What comes next? What is the next step? So they've accepted your offer. Your client has made the escrow. What comes next? All right, no one's typing, so I'll type in the inspection, right? The home inspection. Thank you, Peggy. The home inspection. We know the inspection is coming, right? We, we know that. We're not home inspectors, but here's the thing, right? We want to point certain things out to our clients so they are knowledgeable about them. What do we want to be pointing out? The roof. How old is that roof? Maybe it's getting, you know, to the end of its useful life. You know, in Florida, there are two main types of roofs. One is asphalt shingle, right? Has the shingles on the roof. And then the other is tile, a tile roof. So on an asphalt shingle roof, does anyone know if you're looking at that roof, what might tell you that roof is getting to the end of its useful life? You know, typically asphalt shingle roofs last 15 years is kind of a good, a good gauge. Anybody know what you might see? All right, Andres is typing. Yeah, sand falls off, the, the granulars start to deteriorate. Maybe there are cracked shingles, broken shingles, missing shingles, shingles that are lifting. Sometimes, you know, there's something that I call discoloration, meaning you look at the roof and it's streaky. And that goes back to what Andre said about, you know, the granulars deteriorating. But what happens on a roof, they don't, like the whole thing doesn't like, wear consistently they it often wears inconsistently and it'll look streaky or it'll look like toast right that roof is old now please there is nothing wrong ever with your client purchasing a home that has an older roof nothing wrong with that at all but where the problem becomes is when they didn't know about it they didn't know about it and the home inspector says, oh, you know, that roof's got two years left. And, oh, you're probably looking at, you know, maybe a $12,000 roof job, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, that offer at $395, now they feel, oh, I should have offered $380 or $385. And then you go back to me after the home inspection, I'm the listing agent, and I tell you, I laugh at you and call you a rookie. <laughs> Not really, but you get the point, right? It's very difficult 
to ask for stuff off on the roof, on any of the items we're about to talk about. You don't want to ask. You want to get through that inspection. Sometimes, you know, we have negotiations. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So you want to check out the roof. If you're brand new or newer and you haven't done many transactions and you haven't taken many buyers out, tomorrow when you're out on your walk or you're walking the dog, look at some roofs and see how they look. But again, the takeaway is nothing wrong with your client purchasing a home that has an older roof. It's only when you ask for money off after the home inspection that may fall on deaf ears. Tile roofs. So tile roofs, you can't really tell, right? Because the tiles cover the membrane. Asphalt shingle roofs, 15 years, 16 years, something like that. Tile roofs can last 30 years, 35 years. So you're out showing a home from 1993. That's now 30 years. That probably, unless there's remarks, right, that that's a new roof, probably the original roof. Probably needs to be swapped out relatively soon. Tile roofs last longer, but they cost more to replace. So that asphalt shingle roof on that 2,000 square foot home, you know, that was 11 or $12,000 on that same home with a tile roof, you know, might be 18, 20, 22,000, much more expensive. They do last longer, but again, you know, those are the type of things when people find out, oh, the roof is at the end and then they didn't know that, that's where potentially you can have some issues. So you got to be taking a look at that roof. The AC system. Let's talk a little bit about that. So the AC system is composed of two things. The compressor, typically outside, up on the roof, right? That's what generates the hot, not very often the hot air, but, you know, very few nights we need, you know, heat on in Florida, but there are some, and it cools the house down. And then there's an air handler. The air handler might be in a closet, might be in the attic, right there, a system that works together. Typically the AC system, again, 13, 15, you know, they're run all the time, so they don't last that long. You know, again, Depending on the grade, you're looking, you know, eight to ten, twelve thousand dollars for, you know, kind of a top of the line system. And they do the whole thing. They do the air handler, they do the compressor. Again, right, you know, they hear from the home inspector. Oh, the AC system is at the end. And it's a first time home buyer. And they don't have an extra 10 or 12 grand. Now they have to they have to cancel. You never should have went under agreement with them to begin with. That wasn't the house for them because the agent didn't point out the AC system. So, you know, what I used to do, I let my client do their thing, right? You know, I open up, you know, and then I kind of let them, you know, check out the house on their own. But I'm checking out the roof, the AC, the electrical, the windows, right? All the big ticket items. And if I see anything that looks older or at the end of its useful life, I mention it, especially if there's interest. You wanna make them as aware as possible. Now, again, we're not home inspectors, right? But we can kinda, we can kinda tell. All right, the electrical panel. So the electrical panel, so what we do there, we are primarily looking at the brand the brand. So there are three brands, right, that I know of in Florida that are uninsurable. Uninsurable. Your client's not going to be able to get insurance on the house. Can't. If they're getting a mortgage, that's not going to work. They, the lender's not going to lend them money, you know, if that house isn't insured, has to be insured. And most people, even if they're cash, right, they want to have insurance when they move in. So, the three brands to note are Federal, 
Federal Pacific, Challenger, and Zinco. Please remember those, right? Because when you see one, it'll be right on the panel. Oh, this is an uninsurable electrical box. It's going to have to be swapped out. You know, we need to address that if you're interested in the house, right? You're going to seem very smart and very knowledgeable. What are some good brands? GE, Westinghouse, Square D. You know, those are the probably the big three, right? So those are all good. Those are all good. But Zinco, Challenger, Federal Pacific, problematic. Who knows what the four point is? Anybody know what that is? Four point inspection. Anybody know? Four point. So if a house is built, if a house is 30 years old or more, the insurance carrier for your client to get insurance, the home inspector is going to have to provide a four point inspection. It's additional to the home inspection. It's like 100 bucks, 125 bucks, and they are going to review four things. Anybody know what they are? What is that inspector looking for? What are the four points they are noting? All right, could be a stumper, right? No one, oh, James is typing. Let's see what James has to say. No, wind mitigation. Hey, James, how are you? Nope, the wind mitigation is, that's why you guys are here to take this class. The wind mitigation has to do with how the roof is strapped on. All right, we've got a few things here. So the wind mitigation, James, they will get credits for that right, if the roof is strapped, strapped on a certain way, because what the insurance company is worried about is when a hurricane hits, the roof blows off, and that's where they really suffer a huge, a huge loss. All right, Peggy nailed it. <laughs> Peggy nailed it. So it is the electrical, the roof, the plumbing, and the HVAC. So those four systems all have to pass in order for your client to get insurance. Your, your home inspector has to issue a clean four point. Now, sometimes, sometimes, you know, we have a Dalton Wade agent, you know, she's an insurance broker as well. She may be able to help you out by writing a short term policy. All the lender cares about, right? All the lender cares about is on closing, the home is insured. They, they don't need to know that it's going to be insured in a month or two months, just that closing. So a lot of times what can happen, and if anybody needs, her name is Nicole Allen, happy to get your, you know, happy to get you her contact information. So she might be able to write a 30-day policy. Maybe it's the roof that's problematic. They put the new roof on and then they get permanent insurance. Perfect. They can still buy the house. So you want to be resourceful in that regard. So again, getting back to the electrical system, you know, again, you're going to look at the, you know, you're going to look at the brand. You're going to see maybe there's aluminum wiring, cloth wiring. Those sometimes can be problematic. The home inspector is going to go further. He's going to go further. He's actually going to unscrew the box, right? So it's down to the guts, the breakers. Again, missing breakers, problematic. Two circuits going into one breaker called the double tap, sometimes problematic, right? So again, you're not going to be able to see those things. But again, what you're looking for you know, are the brand and making sure, you know, the property is insurable. The windows right, the windows, you know, windows today, you know, to put new replacement windows in, I mean, you, know, you can get some cheap ones, but, you know, you're probably looking at, you know, five to $700 a window for hurricane rated windows, right? So if the house has 20 windows, you know, you're looking at 10 to $14,000 to replace them out. 
you know, that house from 1993, all the, all the seals are cracked, right? Don't look good. Cosmetically, it looks bad, probably not energy efficient, right? So, you know, that cool air used to be the hot air, but the cool air is going right out the window, literally costing them much more to heat and cool their home. My neighbor, I live in a condo that was built in 1983. So it's 40 years old. He just put in, we have the original windows and sliders. He just put all, all new windows in, new sliders. You know, he reduced his energy bill by $250 a month. So, you know, what's that? That's three grand a year. So, you know, in three, four years, it's paid itself back. Plus it looks a lot nicer. Everything, everybody likes new, right? So new windows are good. So you want to check out those windows. You know, sometimes, you know, you might have a historical house that has single pane and, you know, that's fine because, you know, it kind of goes with the house. But, you know, again, something built in 1990, you know, you're going to check out those windows, you know, and see how they look. See what condition they're in. Because the home inspector is probably, if he's a good inspector, he's going to open every window. I remember being on a home inspection once and the guy opened one window a room. I'm like, what are you doing? He wasn't my guy. You know, they picked him. I recommended he's opening like one window. I'm like, he goes, I spot check. Well, dude, what about the ones that you didn't open? Maybe they're broken. Not impressive. Not impressive at all. All right. Termites. Termites. Talk a little bit about termites. So, you know, I learned something. I don't know where I learned it, but I learned something in the last month. And I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about it. So, you know, so a termite inspection. So if you have a VA buyer, VA is the Veterans Administration. So, you know, we love our servicemen and service women. You know, the VA protects them. Right, so a termite inspection with a VA buyer, mandatory. Has to happen, have to turn in that termite inspection in order for your, to the lender, in order for your client to get approved. So I hate to say this, but I know way too much since I moved to Florida about termites, way too much. So there's two types of termites. There are called subterranean, subterranean termites. And then there are called dry wood. So subterranean termites live in the ground and then they tunnel up. And, you know, I used to say, oh, you know, when I was a real estate agent up in Massachusetts, um, you know, I actually had a termite inspector in my house because we have a little bit of frass. And we'll talk about that in a second. And we were talking and he's I'm mentioning subterranean termites and how they don't exist in Massachusetts, where I was originally trained or started my real estate career. And he tells me they do. They do. They are so indestructible, those termites, right, that even though the ground freezes, they're able to still live, right? So subterranean termites live in the ground and they tunnel up. They make these mud tubes. They tunnel into the home and then they start eating the wood. Dry wood termites fly in. Fly in and go to the wood. You know, in Florida, it's not a question of if. if it's not a question of if you have termites. It's a question of when you will have them. Very prevalent. You always want to recommend, obviously, VA mandatory termite inspection, but you always want to recommend it's short money, a hundred bucks. A home inspector is not a termite inspector. You want a termite professional to come out and take a look at that house. You know, I had a listing once um, and we were under agreement. It was a condo and it was on the 10th floor and the condominium building steel and concrete there's no wood anywhere no wood anywhere so we're doing the home inspection and guess what in the kitchen cabinets in the bathroom cabinets which is probably the only wood they're infested with termites they flew in <laughs> on the 10th floor right so you never know true story 
All right. So again, you, does anybody know what are some signs of termites? And it is not eaten wood. It is not damaged wood. That wood could have been damaged years ago. This is active termites now. Active dry wood termites. Anybody know what you might see? Yeah, well, you see them around your windows, dust. So two things, both, both are correct. So what I believe Peggy is referring to are the wings, termite wings. They're like translucent wings. Those are the little buggers trying to fly out. They fly into the window and their wings fall off and they die. So you might see wings, right? Wings all over the place. That is a sign that that house has an active termite issue right now. And then what Andres mentioned was dust. Well, I call that is termite poop. <laughs> that is termite excrement. That is the termites excreting the wood. And what you'll see is it looks like dust, but it's kind of the coffee, the color, it's brownish, it tends to be in a pile, right? Or it might be scattered around right? Those are, again, active termite issue. More than like, so again, you would probably want to do, that's why you need that termite inspector, because they're going to, the termite inspectors know where those termites live, right? And they're going to look there. So again, you always want to recommend to your client termite inspection. All right, ceiling stains, let's talk a little bit about that. That has to do with the roof. So, you know, when a roof fails, right? It just doesn't all give away and it starts leaking. That's not how it goes. Typically, it'll wear out like in one spot. Maybe there was a leak. Maybe they didn't put a new roof on, but they patched that leak and then it's leaked into the house and there's stains on the ceiling or maybe that spot they painted over and it doesn't quite match or maybe they use kills, right? But you kind of, oh, that doesn't look right. Could be a roof issue. So you're, <coughs> excuse me, you're having a critical eye, right? You're having a critical eye when you're looking at that home. Non-dramatic, right? No, no drama, just, hey, looks like that roof is getting to the end. I just wanted to make you aware of that. Again, as I said earlier, no issue having your client purchase a home with an older roof as long as they're aware of it. And then certainly your clients are going to notice the upgrades, the open floor plan, all those nice things, the new bathroom, you know, right? I mean, you know, that's one of the more fun things. I mean, at least it was for me, showing houses, being in homes, looking at all the different homes. And you see some really nice ones and you see some, you know, that are kind of, you know, maybe a little dated. And then you see some that are in very rough condition. Everybody likes that open concept, right? And then what you're trying to do on that first time out, you're trying to learn, right, what your client really needs. You know, I had a referral. It was one of my first clients here in Florida, and I got referred. They were a young couple, and I got referred to the wife's parents, Dave and Jeannie, you know, and they were they were hot, hot tickets. And, you know, we go out, and Dave, and this is what happens. Most clients today you know, they're going to tell you what they want to see. And then you might supplement that with a few of your own ideas, you know, to make a nice tour. What's a nice tour? Five to six homes, right? You start getting up to eight, 10 in one time out, too much. They all start to blend together. Your client can't remember one from the other. So five to six homes, right? So again, you know, with Dave and Jeannie, so Dave, <laughs> Dave was great guy, but he's got us looking at some homes. We we're looking at condos and single family houses. You know, they had a modest budget and they were looking for one, you know, they needed two baths. He's, he's good with one bath. You know, they have three grown daughters. Jeannie is not purchasing a home with one bathroom. Just not happening. So next time out, no one bathrooms on the list. Right. So you're listening. Maybe they need a two car garage. Maybe they need it. Whatever it is, pool, whatever that feature is. I mean, every buyer wants more for their budget than what they can afford. I mean, that's just human nature. 
but you want to try to find them the best house that really meets their needs, right? So you got to understand their wants and needs. And then you're going to try to schedule that next time out. You know, again, buyers that are serious, they will they will go out several times. I mean, you know, fortunately for me, my last two buyer transactions, they were both referrals. And again, you know, my last one, I haven't done a deal in quite a while, was right before COVID. And again, it was a referral from Dave and Jeannie. That's how this business works when you do a great job, right? It's hard in the beginning, right? Because you don't have any clients and you don't have any referrals. But as you start to do some transactions, people will refer you out. They will mention you. So again, you want to schedule that next time out. What are you doing Saturday? Maybe you took them out today. What are you doing Saturday? I've got some time from 11 to 2. We'll go out for three hours. You do some searching. You see if you, you know, if there's anything of interest, you know, I'll look. I'll try to come up with a tour of, you know, five to six properties that I think might work. And off you go. Keeping the momentum going. So you take them out on Saturday and they fall in love with one of the houses and that's the house they want to make an offer on. And they say to you, hey, can you run some comps for me? Now, again, here's the thing. Comps are like what a home is worth is very subjective, very subjective. You know, I had one of my really good agents. She called me today and, you know, she's the listing agent and the house is listed at $799 and the appraisal came in at $750. And she's mad because the appraiser you know, pick some really bad comps and use one that was, you know, active and, you know, difficult. I'm like, you know, there's only a few things you can do. You know, you can hold them because they don't have an appraisal contingency. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a couple slides, right? You could force them potentially to buy that house because they don't have an appraisal contingency, right? They can't get out just because the appraisal came in low. You can maybe re renegotiate. Maybe you can go back to that appraiser and ask them to take another look. Very difficult. Very difficult to get something that appraises low overturned. Or because it was conventional, it was a conventional buyer, they can apply with a different lender. So when you have an FHA or VA buyer, and that appraisal comes in and it comes in low, that appraisal contingency automatically allows the buyer, if they want, to walk out, to walk away. Talk a little bit more about FHA, VA financing in a bit. They can walk away. They don't have to walk away. Let's use VA because it's the simplest, 100% financing. So they're under agreement at 400 and it comes in at 390. So here are the choices. The buyer can walk away. The seller can lower the price to 390 or maybe they meet in the middle at 395. Maybe the agents kick in 2500 each, right? 400,000, you know, maybe it's a 10 or $12,000 commission. They want to get it closed. They're willing to come off their commission a bit. And then the seller, the buyer, the two agents each reduce by 2500 and it bridges the gap, right? You're always looking for solutions to kind of keep it going. All right, how do you do the comps? Now, again, comps, appraisals, they are just one person's opinion. I can give you numerous stories where the first time I ran into this, I was the listing agent. The house is listed at 279. Property appraises at 249. The buyer's 20% down. He's like, what, what do I do? I mean, I'm not his agent, but he's asking me. I'm like, oh, apply with my lender. <laughs> apply with my lender. And he does. Two weeks later, new appraisal. Same house, 289. This appraiser, I really sweet talked her, right? She values it $10,000 above the list price. 
where the other appraiser called it at 249. Unbelievable. So again, all you're trying to do is kind of make sure your client isn't going overboard and paying way, way too much. All right. So again, you're looking for close. You know, MLS has a really cool feature, a map function. So you can call up all the sold properties on a map and then find the property you're about to make an offer on. And then you want to find the three closest properties, right? A sold house one street away is a better comp than something a mile away. So you want to use that one. You only want sold. You don't want active or pending. You know, I mentioned my last deal. You know, we ended up getting that house for three eighty-five. dollars That house originally started at four twenty-nine, dollars And then it went down to three ninety-nine dollars because, you know, the lady had to buy. She was, you know, under, under contract for new construction. She wanted to sell. So we got it for three eighty-five. dollars 44,000 less than its original price. That's why you never want to use active. You just want to use sold. And again, something that closed today is better than something that closed six months ago. It's more indicative of what the market is now. Then you're going to do your pluses and minuses. How I did it, very simple. You know, there are some automated appraisal software. I hated that stuff. I never used it. I did it very simply. I would do this. I would print out the three MLS listings that I was using as my comps, close and recently sold. And then right on the listing sheet, I do my pluses and minuses. Hey, the house I'm using as a comp doesn't have a garage. The house... We're putting an offer in, does have a garage. I got to add 40,000 to make it apples to apples. A pool is worth about 40,000. A third bedroom is worth, and these are from appraisals. And again, it could be off, could be 30, 40, right? But again, close enough for government work. Third bedroom, very valuable. Why? Well, you have a young couple, maybe they're thinking of having a family. Right. And then if they have two girls, excuse me, if they have one girl and one boy, a two bedroom home, not going to work. Right. That's not going to work. So that third bedroom. Right. Worth some value. Now, maybe they have three kids. The two boys are in one room. The girl's in her own room. Right. So, again, third bedroom valuable. Busy street. Homes on busy streets sell for less. Why? Hard to get out of your driveway. Parents are afraid their kids are going to get run over. I remember, you know, I sold this very nice couple. I sold their condo and then I ended up being their buyer's agent and the house was on a busy street. And I'm like, you know, I mean, because again, they don't sell for as much. I'm like, you know, this is on a busy street. They don't say, oh, he goes, no worries, Phil. You know, both, you know, me and Jenny, you know, we grew up in houses on busy streets. So to them, it's no big deal. Right. And then that fourth bedroom, not as much value there. And then we have the square footage adjustment. Right. So sometimes, I mean, I had a dolphin weight agent, you know, she calls me and she's thinking of selling her house and her house is, you know, 300 square feet larger than, you know, one that just recently sold in her neighborhood. Right. And that sold for 400,000 was 200, you know, 200, 2000 square feet. $200 a square foot. She goes, oh, I think my house is worth $60,000 more. No, <laughs> that is not how it works. You get a percentage, right? Because there's the land, you got to have a roof, right? So you get 30 to 40% if the house is bigger or 30 to 40%, you know, off if it's smaller, but it's not dollar for dollar. Now, in these numbers I'm sharing, those are kind of general, maybe on a $400,000 home, but, you know, on a million dollar home, and hopefully we get to be buyer's agents on those, right? You know, a garage is going to be worth more. A pool is going to be worth more, right? So we have a grid that basically takes the feature, the price point, 
right? So the feature is on one axis, the price point is on another, it's a grid. And then it gives you, and then in the little box, right, is the adjustment. So pool on a $300,000 home, the adjustment is less than on a $750,000. So again, all of this is art, <laughs> it's not science, right? So you're just trying to come up with something to say, hey, you know, I wanted to share this with you. This is what I'm thinking. And then they're going to decide what they want to offer. Hopefully you can work it out and get it accepted. Now, again, you're going to have been out there showing homes in this price point in this area. So you're going to have, you know, some, you know, you have looked at some homes. So you're going to have some idea. I mean, you never know. I mean, I remember working with this client and, um, Oh, the house they bought, I swore it was overpriced, and um, but they didn't care. They didn't care. And I told her, I think it's high, but they wanted the house. And then lo and behold, it appraised out. You never know. You never know. All right. Any questions on that before we kind of move on to talking a little bit about the contract? All right. Type them in if you do. Uh, happy to answer them. So again, this is not a full contract training. Claren does that every other Monday. She's gotten great accolades, very detailed. You will understand that contract inside and out. So what we're going to hit upon tonight are just the sections you have to complete, where you have to either check the box or fill in the blank. All right, so we have a blog article up on the Join Dalton Wade website. It's a checklist. What do you need to make an offer? How much do they want to offer? When do they want to close? How much are they putting in escrow? What type of financing? How much are they put it right? So you need some information from the client in order to put that offer together. Now, to make matters even a bit more confusing in Florida, there are two contracts. There are two contracts. One is called the as is contract. That is the contract that is used in the vast majority of situations, 95% of the homes. And the other one is called the residential contract for purchase and sale. What are the differences? There are three main differences. So with the as is contract, your buyer can walk away for any reason. They don't even need a reason. And maybe they found a better house. They're canceling this contract. Maybe the dog ate the contract and, oh, that's a bad sign from up above. I don't want to buy this house now because I love my dog. The seller is not required to fix anything. They might, they can, but they're not obligated to. So the buyer can walk away within the inspection period, but the buy the seller doesn't have to lower the price, give a credit, repair anything. So the residential contract, the one that's used not quite as much, there the buyer and seller agree up front that if there are any general repairs, any termites, or any permits that need to be closed out, the default is one and a half percent. So if that house is 400,000, the seller is saying, yes, I will fix $6,000 worth of general repairs. I will do a termite treatment up to six dollars $6,000. And if there's any permits that are, you know, unpermitted work, abandoned permits, expired permits, open permits, they will take care of all those. Again, so they do the home inspection and then they find some stuff and then they give the inspection report to the seller and the seller says, no, I don't agree with that. That's wrong. That inspector doesn't know what he's talking about. And then the seller can have a home inspection done. And then the, the buyer says, no, that's wrong too. Then there's a third inspection that's binding. So it gets very convoluted. That's why the other contract is used in many, many, many more 
of the situations. Now, why might an agent use or request you to write the offer up on the residential contract for purchase and sale as opposed to the as is contract? Here's why they did a pre inspection. They did a pre inspection. That might have been something they offered to the seller. Pre inspection, if you give me the listing, I'll pay for that. Right. And when they did the pre inspection, that house, there is nothing to be found. Everything is perfect. Now the buyer is locked in. They can't get out. They already know that house, nothing's going to get turned up in the inspection. In essence, your buyer has purchased that home. So again, inform your client if you need to write it up on that contract. But again, the vast majority are done on the as is contract. So let's talk a little bit about that. Bullet three, the offer amount. Right? How much are they offering? It's going to be based on the comps. Then we come down to the good faith deposit. How much are they putting in escrow? Remember last night we talked about, hey, when we're representing the seller, we want big, right? We want big deposit. We want skin in the game. We want commitment. But when we're the buyer's agent, we want little deposit. We want little deposit. Why? You know, I run into this fairly often where the seller doesn't want to return the deposit, even though everything indicates it should be returned to the buyer. And they basically jerk that buyer around, making it hard for them to get their deposit. Deposits are only released if both parties, the buyer and the seller, sign something telling the title company or escrow agent who is to get that deposit. It's a hassle potentially, right? But it's a less of a hassle if you've only put in $1,000 or $2,000. Please do not get confused. I've seen this happen between what they're putting in escrow and how much they're putting down for their loan. Had a deal, house is 300,000. The agent puts down in escrow 60,000. 60,000. She didn't know what she was doing. She was confused. She thought the deposit, the escrow was the same as how much her client was putting down. He was 20% conventional. She could have lost him $60,000. It ended up closing, thank God, right? Then we come down to the financing amount. What type of financing? VA is 100%. FHA, v, FHA, typically 96.5% financing. Conventional can be 3% down, 5%, 10, 15, 20, or more. So again, depending on how much they're putting down, you're going to put that in, and then it comes down to a balance to close. You know, they're buying the house for 400,000. You know, they're putting 20% down, so they're getting financed 320. They're putting 5,000 in escrow, 325. They need to bring 75,000 to the closing without closing costs. So it kind of does that calculation for you. Then we come down to the offer acceptance date. You want to give them 24 hours to respond. Why? Why so short? Because again, remember what we talked about last night, that second offer comes in. Now it's highest and best. That is a disadvantage to your client, to your buyer. So you want to give them a short amount of time that that offer is valid for. You want to press on that agent, you know, to get a response out of him. And hopefully maybe they have a counter. If they counter, remember when you're the listing agent, you want to counter verbally, right? In case another offer comes in. But if you're the buyer's agent, oh, can you put that in writing for me? Can you put that counter in writing so my client can sign it? Then we have the closing date. Typically any good lender can close in 30 days or less. The only time, you know, somebody might need more time on the offer acceptance, you know, if it's a bank owned property, I don't have as many of those now, but typically that is not going to the homeowner. 
it is going to an asset manager at the bank and they can sometimes take up to a week to respond. Then we go over to section seven, assignability. We see these TV commercials, radio ads, make money in real estate without any money. Make money in real estate without any money. Seminars, right? How do you do that? Here's how. You go under agreement and then you're able to assign that contract to somebody else. So there's three boxes. One is can't assign, right? Somebody buying the house, that's what you're going to check. They're going to live there, right? They're not looking to, they're not, you know, who assigns contracts? Wholesalers, right? You know, they buy at wholesale, they sell at retail, right? Investors, flippers, that kind of, I call it the underbelly of real estate. You know, they're out there, you know, profiting, right? So they want to assign that contract. Sometimes the second box is they can assign the contract, but they're not removed from liability, the original buyer. Who might do that? An investor. So they're buying the house, right? But then what they're going to do, as soon as that offer is accepted, they are going to set up an LLC or a corporation that is going to be buying the house. So they want to assign that contract to that LLC. Perfectly legal, all fine. Then the third box is can assign and be removed from liability. So what happens is, let's just say the house is under agreement for 200,000 and then that wholesaler, flipper, whoever, they find somebody who will pay 225. So they get, basically, they assign that contract to that new buyer and that buyer steps into their shoes, except there's an assignment fee paid at closing to the flipper. So the seller gets 200, the buyer gets, excuse me, the wholesaler flipper, the person with the original contract gets 25,000, the assignment fee, and the buyer pays 225. So again, any questions on that? It can be a little confusing, but hopefully everyone's, you know, kind of got that. All right, number, now we're moving on to section eight. All right. If you take anything out of tonight's training, it is what I'm going to talk about right now. This is the number one screw up I see my agents make around this. I had it happen yesterday. I couldn't believe it. I'm going to tell you the story. So when you're getting a loan, there is what's called a financing contingency, meaning if your client doesn't get the loan, they get their deposit back. Let me say that again. There is a financing contingency. That financing contingency expires. It ends on a date. Now, one of the worst things our lenders, mortgage brokers, mortgage companies. Who are the bad ones? Who are the bad ones? I'll tell you who they are. Bank of America. Citibank, Fifth Third, PNC, TD Bank, Wells Fargo. They all are in the same group. All the big depository banks. Yeah, they're great banks, but they don't do mortgage lending so well. They make you wait. They don't close on time. They don't care. They're slow. If all of a sudden they get busy, they don't go hiring more underwriters. They make your client wait to get approved. That's problematic. Why? So typically what you're going to do is you're going to say, hey, we can close. And you're going to check with the lender. You you know, to make a strong offer, you can close in 30 days. And then you're going to have the financing contingency 30 days. So your client is protected right up to the last day, right up to closing. Then here's the problem. The problem is when the lender can't close on time. 
can't close on time. So now the closing has to be extended and the financing contingency should always be extended or at least mentioned to your client. So again, what happened yesterday? So Dalton Wade agent, she's actually buying the house for herself and her husband. And the lenders, you know, messing around, can't get it closed and they extend the closing date, but then they don't extend the financing contingency date. Now they are cash buyers cash buyers. A mortgage is cash, right? You don't have to have a financing contingency. You always want to have one, but you don't need to, even if your client's getting, you know, I mean, I used to have agents call me like they were cash and now they're doing an appraisal. Yeah, they can do that. A mortgage is cash. The financing contingency is when your client isn't approved. So what she should have done is extended the closing date and the financing contingency date. Guess what happened? Lender can't do it. Lender is now they're denied, but now there's no financing contingency, so they're not entitled to get their deposit back. She's very upset, and you know, like again, you want to extend that financing contingency. I think what happens is sometimes. Agents don't want to have the conversation with their client. Think of this, right? You've been out there. You showed them 40 houses. You thought they were never, I mean, it's been a lot of work, right? But finally, you got them under agreement, and they were difficult through the home inspection, but you kept it going. You got some concessions, and now it's time to close, and the lender's not ready. And then what should happen is you have a, very frank conversation with your client. Hey, because most listing agents won't extend, some will, but most won't. Most won't extend that financing contingency. What they're going to say is, hey, you've already had 30 days and now you need more time. We'll give you more time, but we're not extending that financing contingency. And they neglect to tell their client that. And they stick an addendum in front of the client and it only is extending the closing date. And then guess what happens? They don't get the loan and then they want their deposit back because the agent didn't advise them correctly how that conversation should have gone. It's a tough conversation. The lender's not ready. What do you want to do? I can, we can cancel now all that work down the drain or we can keep going because you believe in the end you're going to get that loan. And then if they don't get the loan, you inform them what would happen if they didn't. It's when they're not informed. They're like, where's my deposit? Then it becomes a problem. You know, when you work with a lender, lenders are bad. Lenders, I've never met a lender. They will tell you they can do it. Oh, we can do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it up until they can't do it. And then they, they tell you, oh, sorry. They, they are the most confident people because they don't want you to walk away, but they don't care about your deposit. So having a good lender takes this right out of the equation. You know, me, I had a one strike rule, one strike. If you're a lender and you screw up, I am done with you. I give you one, one chance, one time. You do me wrong once, I'm never using you again. You've created so much stress for me. I worked so hard, and then my deal is not going to close because of you. Again, who are the bad lenders? I mentioned them. They have a tougher time. You know, when you're working with a lender and you don't know them, you've lost control. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. How do you get your client to your lender so that you're insured that this deal is going to happen? So one of the things we do is we negotiate. 
right? We negotiate. So let's just say, you know, the client, you know, the seller is at 300, your client is at 290. So you're 10,000 apart. I would have a conversation with my with my buyer. Hey, we're 10,000 apart. You know, what's been very effective for me is, you know, you come up five to 295. We'll see if we can get the seller to come down five to 295. We'll meet in the middle. I love that. Meet in the middle. Very effective. And they say, Phil, we're going to go out and have some dinner. We're going to chat about that and we'll get back to you in the morning. So they go out to dinner. They have a couple of drinks. And then they say, that Phil, he is a SOB. <laughs> he is an SOB. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about us. He only wants us to pay $5,000 more. So he gets his commission. I'm starting not to like Phil. Same conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Same conversation, but just said a little differently. Hey, we're at 290. They're at 300. You come up to 295. I'll see if I can get them to come down to 295. And then the last words out of my mouth, whenever, whenever I'm telling my client to do something, we are professionals. We can have an opinion. But the last thing I tell them, it is up to you. If you don't want to pay $5,000 more, fine. I don't care. I'm going to do. I wish you would, but I'm not going to. It is up to them, right? It is up to them. And that's the same thing with a lender. You know, maybe they come in, they're pre-approved, and they're pre-approved by Bank of America. And you're like, oh, my God, this is going to be difficult. So you could say something like, you know, Bank of America doesn't have the best reputation out there. They don't seem to close on time. Listing agents know this. It's going to make it harder for us to get our offer accepted. Would you like to speak to my lender? He's awesome. He gets it close on time every time. But it's up to you. I'm just suggesting this. And then if they want to continue on with Bank of America, then that's the card you're dealt. But maybe you planted that idea and they will switch or at least talk to your lender. You want to use a mortgage company or a mortgage broker. That's all they do. They tend to be much better. So please make sure you understand that financing contingency. We're going to talk about the dates in a couple of slides. You got to be on top of that. If you have any questions about that, you know, and you're getting time to your financing contingency is ending and you're not sure on the lender, you know, call support, call me, you know, we will guide you. But you do not, it is unacceptable to lose your client's deposit. I mean, if they want to lose it, they want to risk it, and you inform them, no issue. But that's usually not what happens. What I think happens, the agent wants to roll their dice, roll the dice with their client's deposit because they don't want to hear, oh, I want to cancel. All that work down the drain. So, oh, let's just see what – I had an agent, <laughs> experienced Dalton Wade agent. He calls me up, and he's like, oh, I have a problem. I'm like, what's that? Oh, they don't want to give the deposit back. I'm like, okay, what about the financing contingency? And then there's silence. I'm like, Joe, what about the financing contingency? He goes, well, you know, um, you know, I didn't extend that, but you know, the other, the other two or three times this has happened, it closed. <laughs> that is, not, this time it didn't close, and your client lost their deposit, and you didn't do a very good job. He felt so bad. I think he gave them their money back. You don't want to be doing that. All right, moving on. We've beaten on that, but it is important. It is the number one problem I deal with. We're like, again, experienced agent buying the house for herself lets the financing contingency expire and then expects to get her deposit back. It just doesn't work like that. I mean, they were very generous, quite honestly. They were willing to split it with her. They could have taken her whole $5,000. And one, she had no, no leg to stand on. All right, moving on. Section nine, who selects the title company? So typically the seller selects the title company unless you are in Dade County, Broward County, Manatee County, and Sarasota County. Those four counties 
typically the buyer selects the title company. Everywhere else in the state, it is customary that the seller selects the title company. Now, when the buyer selects the title company, they pay for their own title insurance. When the seller selects the title company, they pay for the buyer's title insurance. Again, the buyer is making the offer so they can do whatever they want in that offer, but that's typically how it's done. Those are the customs out there. Then we move on still in section nine, seller to pay assessments in full. So there's a box that basically says if there are, what's an assessment? An assessment is, you know, the county came in a year ago, paved the road or put in sewers and each home was assessed $10,000. And rather than having to pay that up front, they're letting them pay that via their taxes over the next 10 years, $1,000 a year. And there's still a $9,000 lien on that property. Who's going to pay that? So if we check the box, seller to pay assessments in full, the seller pays that $9,000. The other box is, you know, buyer to pay the assessment. So the buyer takes those assessments on. So you always want to start with the seller to pay the assessments. Then we move on to the home warranty. Again, most properties, you know, you're not going to have a home warranty, so you're going to check NA, right? But if you do, maybe there's an older AC system or some older appliances, right? Um, you know, you're going to get them a home warranty and the sell, you're going to check the seller is going to pay for that. You know, if you spend 650 bucks, 700 bucks, you're going to get the Cadillac of, of, you know, of, you know, home warranties. But again, most times there isn't, we just want to check NA. Right. Then we move down to section 12, which is the inspection period. Another one that can be tricky, right? Operationally. So again, the buyer can cancel for any reason during the inspection period. But what happens? Well, a lot of times these things go right to the last day and you're negotiating. You know, maybe your buyer's looking for a $5,000 credit or whatever it is, but it hasn't been completely agreed to. And then tomorrow, you're out of the inspection period. So what you need to do, if you're still negotiating that inspection, right, you're not going to send over release and cancellation. You're going to send an email. You can send an email to the listing agent that basically says, whatever you're asking for, if you don't get it, you are canceling the contract. And then tomorrow comes and they can't agree, you've protected their deposit. They're entitled to get their deposit back. They do agree. Everybody agrees. Great. You keep moving. All is good. But you've protected their deposit, right? The inspection contingency by notifying the listing side, if whatever you're asking for, if you don't receive it, you are canceling. Then we go from, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow night, but I'll mention it now, texting. Texting does not count. <laughs> texting is not how you notify anybody of anything in this business. It doesn't, you know, real estate agents, they love to text. It is the preferred communication, right? But it doesn't, oh, uh, I texted you that if we didn't get this, this, and that, we're canceling. That doesn't count. Has to be an email. Texting, it's like you didn't even send it. All right, that's section 12. Then there's some boilerplate again. Claren goes through all the boilerplate. I'm going to skip that. Then we move down to the addendums. What are the addendums? Condominium writer. Home Association Addendum, a Lead Paint Addendum, a FHA VA Addendum, a Sale of Home Addendum. If your client has to sell their home to purchase this home, you're going to have a Home Sale Addendum. If you're buying a house for yourself or a family member, you're going to have Licensee Interest in Property Addendum. You're going to let everybody know you're a real estate agent. 
That's section 19. All right, then we're going to move on. Let's talk a little bit more about the VA, FHA financing, conventional financing. So VA, FHA. No, for all intents and purposes, no, no condominiums, no condos, right? So in order for FHA or VA to finance a condominium, not only does the buyer have to be approved, but the condominium association has to be approved and 99% of them in Florida are not approved. So if you're out there and you have an FHA VA buyer and you're showing them condominiums, you are wasting your time and their time. That transaction will never happen. Do not assume the listing agent has taken my training. They oftentimes don't even know what they're doing. They don't know this. It's unbelievable. You know, I tell the good and the bad. I'll tell you the bad in a minute when we talk a little bit about conventional financing. All right, so VA, FHA, no condominiums. How do you know if it's a condo? Right in the legal description, it is going to say 123 Jones Street, condo. <laughs> right? It's going to tell you in that legal description the word condo is going to be there or the word condominium is going to be there. Right in the legal description, that's legally what it is. So no FHA, VA. What can you sell them? What might work for them? Townhouse. Villa. Again, those are legal statuses of certain properties. Why do those, like a townhouse looks very much like a condo, right? You know, someone does the lawn, someone, you know, man, you know takes care of the, the grounds. There's a pool, a tennis, right? Why, why will FHA, VA finance a townhouse in a, or a villa? It's called fee simple, right? The townhouse, the buyer owns the land under the townhouse. A villa, the buyer owns the land for that villa. FHA, excuse me, condominiums, the condo association owns the land. And that's why it's problematic. So again, if you have a client that wants that kind of condominium lifestyle, going FHA, VA, townhouse, or villa. Condominium, you're just wasting your time. Talk a little bit more about condominiums. Conventional financing. Conventional financing. So with conventional financing, here's how it works. So again, Conventional financing will finance condominiums. 5, 10, 15, or 20% down. So your client is putting 5, 10, 15, or 20% down. There is what is called a full review. Full review. So the lender is going to generate a questionnaire. Actually, there's 20 questions on it. There are four that are important for all intents and purposes. And we're going to go through those. Is there a budget? You know, we're still in 2023. So we'll say, is there a 2023 budget showing? You have to supply the budget, right, to the lender. Is there a budget showing that 10% of what they collect in condo fees goes to reserves? Ten percent goes to reserves. Why? Like, why would a lender want that? Here's why. So condominiums historically have taken bigger losses. You know, all the lenders concerned with is getting their money back. And places that don't have large reserves or are collecting ten percent to put into reserves, what can happen is there's not enough money to keep the place in good shape so it starts to deteriorate and then if they have to foreclose the property is not worth as much so question one is there a budget and does that budget show 10 percent of what is collected so they collect a million dollars in condo fees 
10% is going to reserves. Question one. Question two. Does one person own more than 10% of the units? Again, why, why is that important? Same concept, right? The guy who owns 10%, he stops paying his condo fees. And now there's not enough money. Place goes into disrepair. And if they have to foreclose, they suffer a loss. You know, again, I tell you the bad story now. Like I get a call and she goes, Phil, you know, and she's an experienced agent, you know, but she didn't know this. And she goes, everybody's mad at me. I'm like, oh, what's 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 happening? Oh, you know, I'm under agreement. I'm the listing agent. And uh, come to find out one guy owns like 70% of the units. And they're conventional, 20% down. It failed on that test. Now, she should have known that. She should have checked if you're the listing agent and you're listing a condominium, you're going to call that, you know, management company. You're going to find out these four questions before you list it. So you know who you can sell it to. Right. She sold it to somebody who could never buy it. They didn't qualify right from the beginning, but she didn't call and find that out. Question three. Does one are 15 percent of the condominium owners delinquent? Are they delinquent? If they're delinquent, 15% or more, there's no 5, 10, 15, or 20% down conventional financing. It's out. Same question. You're going to find that out before you list it. Last question. Is there any litigation against the condominium association? Typically, that will not go 5, 10, 15, or 20% down. They are called non-warrantable condos. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right, who kind of finance these things, they do not warrant them. They will not finance them. Now, again, you could find sometimes there's programs out there you know, maybe through a credit union or a mortgage broker. So it's not going conventional. It's not going Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. There's a private investor. There was a program, you know, a few years back, 15% down, 715 credit score. They would finance a non-warrantable condo. So there can be some options. Typically, mortgage brokers have products like that. You know, our previous kind of preferred lender, strictly conventional, FHA, VA, very little out-of-the-box lending, very narrow. Our new lender, many, many, many more products, right? He may have something that fits into this box. What if your client is putting down more than 20%? What if they're putting down 25, 30, 50% down? Then the only then it's called a limited review. So again, there's a questionnaire that comes out. It's limited, and there's one question typically: Is there any litigation against that condominium association? That tends to be problematic, no matter how much the person is putting down. So really understanding that, especially if you're the listing agent. So obviously, if you're listing a condo, no FHA, no VA. And then you're going to talk to a lender, excuse me, you're going to talk to the management company and you're going to find out who can buy this. All right, a little bit off the contract, but kind of a good place to, condos are tricky. A lot of agents don't understand them. They struggle with them. Don't be that agent. All right, then we move down to section 20 which is the additional term. So again, we want to avoid, you know, we're going to talk tomorrow, tomorrow night about the, uh, it's, 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 Andres, it's more than 20%. So 20% falls into the full review, above 20%, 25% limited review. Those have a much better chance of getting done. But you should know, I mean, and again, you're kind of relying on the listing agent. You're not going to go and call the management company. You know, just like the Dalton Wade agent, she didn't call and it became a problem and she wasted time. 
She never should have gone under agreement with them. So we don't want that, right? We want everything to go smooth. We want happy clients on both sides. All right. Then we move on to section 20. So again, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow night. Like, here's what we get to do. We get to check the boxes and fill in the blanks. That's it. We do not cross things out in the contract. We do not add verbiage. The only place we add verbiage is in section 20. And we want to be very careful what we write there. You know, we had one a home inspection to be done in business days. Okay, well, um, what does that mean? That means they're going to conduct the home inspection on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I don't know. Became very ambiguous. And then all of a sudden there's a problem. There's a disagreement. Shit show. Excuse my French. Right? The guy who wrote it is a broker, has his own brokerage. Again, right? Causing himself problems. Not clear. So typically what we want to go in there, right? is if your buyer needs closing cost assistance, basically meaning the seller is going to pay some of their closing costs. So if you have a conventional buyer, the max assistance is 3%. If you have FHA, VA, six percent maximum credit how do you write that up you know seller to pay i used to like dollar amounts as opposed to percentages you know seller to pay seven thousand dollars of buyers closing costs prepaids and non-allowables very clear what the buyer is doing is they're financing the closing cost by having the seller pay for them, right? The seller is going to get the net, right? They're going to, you know, let's say the property's under agreement for 350. They're really getting 344 because they're asking for a $6,000 credit. Closing cost credits are not viewed as a strong offer. I used to have, Sellers say to me, they can't pay their closing costs. How are they going to buy this? Plus, now the property has to appraise for more, right? You could have offered $344, but you offered $350 because you have that $6,000 credit. Now it has to appraise at $350 as opposed to $344. Sometimes appraisers see that and they're going to value it at 340 at 344. You never know. Sometimes you can get it accepted, but you know, again, talk to your client's lender, ask them, do they need closing cost assistance? Talk to your client, see what they think. Again, you know, it was very popular back when rates were 3%. It was almost like free money. You know, now not so much. The rates are higher, it's not quite as attractive to have the seller finance your closing costs. All right, so any questions? You know, we covered a lot of ground here. You know, that financing contingency, oh, it's problematic for me. I I lose it when the agent calls. I mean, I don't, but I just like, damn, you know, why do you take the trainings? Because they're not professionals. I commend everybody here tonight. Impressive. All right, any last questions before we move on? All right, home inspection, home inspection. So I don't want to say this first bullet is controversial, but I personally went to every home inspection my buyers ever had. 100% I'm there all the time, every time. Two reasons, support for my client and to really understand, you know, what is that inspector finding? Because I may have to negotiate some some things. I mean, I mean, need to really understand them. What agents don't go to home is lazy agents. You know, last night we used the F word, remember free, <laughs> right? Free leads where you can get them. Tonight it's the L word, lazy. They don't go because they're lazy. That's all it is. They don't want to spend three hours, so they don't go. 
again, you know, maybe there's a tiny, tiny, like a, a sliver, or even smaller, like a liability, but you know, that's just BS. You got to be there. Then you're going to have to negotiate the inspection, right? You might have to ask for some things. So let's talk a little bit about that. So four points, we talked about four points. So sometimes if whatever is deficient on that four point, if it's not fixed, you can't close. So you got to get that fixed. You got to come up with a repair addendum fixing that. On the FHA VA addendum, there's a section that says the seller will pay up to, let's say, $1,000 if left blank. You can put a number in there if you want. Because what ends up happening, so the appraiser, not the home inspector, but the appraiser for the lender, he's going to appraise the property for value. Right. But he's also, if he's FHA VA, he's looking for things, condition. So conventional, they're much more lenient than FHA VA. Why? There's no equity in the home, very little equity, VA 100%, zero equity to start. FHA VA 3.5%. So HUD, who administers FHA VA, they want to make sure that house is in certain condition. The roof has to have three years of life left. There can be no wood rot, chipped paint, broken windows, cracked flooring, safety violations. Now, if the lender calls some things out, meaning their appraiser, it's not a home inspection. But if he notes some things in his appraisal, they have to be fixed. Have to be fixed have to be addressed. And the appraiser has to come back out and attest that they have been taken care of or they're not going to get the loan. Those are the only two places you want to have a repair addendum. Four point and FHA VA appraisal that noted something. Other than that, stay away from repair addendum. Why? Here's why. Have a an agent with a deal and um, beautiful home. A few years back, you know, I think it was under agreement for seven fifty. Probably today, that house is you know one point two million. So a really nice house. But there's one kind of strange thing in the master bedroom. Beautiful master in the master bedroom. There's a there's a door like a steel door that goes out to the garage. And it looks hideous in this beautiful home. So they write up an addendum that says seller to wall in door leading to garage in master bedroom. And they go and they Buyer's obviously curious, right? They're going to, you know, it's the final walkthrough and they want to see what they did and they go and they did a terrible job. The paint, they didn't paint the room, the woodwork, you know, the tr it's just a mess. It's t it looks bad. And the buyer's pissed. I'm not closing. And we go back to the listing agent and we say, hey, can you help us here? No. Go find another house, she tells us. The buyer's agent did it to herself. She did it to herself. All she should have done. It was probably a $1,500, $2,000 job. What she should have asked for is a credit, a closing cost credit. Seller to provide $2,000 closing cost credit to buyer, right? So now the buyer has $2,000 extra after closing to fix that door however they want. Remember, sellers are on their way out. They don't care. Sometimes there's misunderstandings as to exactly what's to be repaired, right? People can be really picky. Then they get upset, and especially if it's been a hard negotiation. Oh, they've been jerking me around the entire time. This is the final straw. 
all that work could have been done a different way, right? All they, she should have gotten them a credit. There would have been no, no stress, no controversy right at the end. If you do have to write a repair addendum, this is how it's written. Whatever you're asking them to do, work to be done by a licensed professional, receipts provided, and permits pulled. Work to be done by a licensed professional, receipts provided, and permits pulled. So in Florida, there is no such thing as a handyman. You're either a licensed plumber, electrician, roofer, AC, general contractor, no handyman. Had one one time, you know, we're on the right side of the equation. I get a call. She's the listing agent. And um, she said, I have a little problem. I'm like, what's that? Oh, we wrote a repair addendum. And uh, the buyer's in the house now, and a week and a half later, you know, the hot water tank blew up and flooded the house. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry for the buyer's agent. They didn't write that it had to be done by a licensed plumber. The homeowner did the work. <laughs> they let the homeowner do the work, and he obviously didn't know what he was doing. Again, I'll say it one more time. Closing credit better than repair. Stay away from those repair addendums. They are snake pit waiting to bite you. And if you have to have one, work to be done by a licensed professional, receipts provided, and permits pulled. Any questions on that? But again, you know, be at that home inspection, negotiate that inspection, stay away from repairless. Yeah, I mean, they can, but <laughs> again, they're not a licensed professional. They're not a licensed electrician or plumber. And the risk is they don't know what they're doing. And it's all fine until it's not. All right, key buyer dates, key buyer dates. So escrow, escrow has to be made within three days. So you go under agreement today, today, Tuesday, is considered the effective date. Today is day zero. We count from today. So Wednesday, day one, Thursday, day two, Friday, day three, that deposit needs to be with the escrow company by Friday. Loan application, typically five days. Wednesday, day one, Thursday, day two, Friday, day three, Saturday, day four, Sunday, day five. So if the last day ends on a Saturday, Sunday, or federal holiday, you get to the next business day at 11.59 p.m. So you get a little bit of an extension. Inspection contingency, you know, the default is 15 days. So you count the weekend days, you count the holidays. It's only if it lands on a Saturday or Sunday, you get to Monday, if Monday is a federal holiday, you get to Tuesday. Same with that financing contingency, right? Again, you're going to count all the days, but if it lands on a Saturday, Sunday, you get to Monday. If Monday, you know, is New Year's Day, you know, Christmas, I think those are going to land on Monday this year, you get to Tuesday. Got to know your dates because we do not want to be losing our clients' deposits. Got to be on top of your dates. All right, Dalton Wade Buyer Acknowledgement. So the Dalton Wade Buyer Acknowledgement is a disclosure. You know, tomorrow night we're going to talk about the buyer broker agreement. You know, I don't know if anybody has been reading, but there have been some lawsuits, which unfortunately NAR has lost, at least initially. So that buyer broker agreement becomes really more important. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow night. So that's not what this is. This is an acknowledgement. So here's here's how this goes so you know in actuality we as real estate agents we're not really responsible for all that much the buyer is actually responsible for quite a bit 
in terms of their own due diligence around that house. This reminds them of that. We want every, every closing, we want this signed by the buyer, acknowledging that they've read it and they understand it, what they're responsible for. Because what happens is sometimes, and these are small, relatively small complaints that happen, you know, that buyer's in the house and now they find things and they start complaining you know we had one this was probably the most crazy one but we have one where um it's an hoa and um the hoa does not allow trucks in the driveway you can put it in your garage but if you have a truck it can't be parked in your driveway so the buyer's son has a truck and he has a pool table in the garage, so he can't, of course, put his truck there. So he has to trade in his truck, which he does for an SUV, which qualifies. Then the buyers want the listing agent and us to pay for the difference between his SUV and his truck. This is a true story. Her name was Jill. I'm like, Jill, did they sign the Dalton Wade buyer acknowledgement? Yeah, they did. Well, right in it, it says they read the homeowner's documents. They, they knew that. They told us they knew that. End of story, <laughs> right? So these things are to protect us. So we always want that signed. All right, the final walkthrough. We're getting there. So the final walkthrough, again, once your client closes, they own the house. It is their house, right? So again, agents that don't go to the final walkthrough, I'm going to use that L word. They are lazy. They are lazy. You know, I had an agent call me up. He goes, I have a problem. Nobody calls me with good stars. They only call with their problems. They call. He says, I have a problem. I'm like, what's that? Oh, well, he starts, you know, kind of, um, you know, we closed. It was a mobile closing. That's where, you know, the, title company sends a mobile notary and everything is done remotely and it's closed. Everything's signed. It's done. And the, you know, the buyer's out of state. And then he went to the house after the closing and they had agreed there was an addendum that the seller was going to remove a whole bunch of debris. And guess what? None of it's removed. None of it's removed. He goes, what do I do? Well, here's what you do. You call the listing agent and you ask them, and hopefully this is what happened because you never called me back. You call the listing agent and you ask them, hey, is your seller going to do the right thing, as they said, and get that stuff out of there? Or you're going to reach into your pocket, you're going to take part of your commission, and you're going to call 1-800-JUNK, and they're going to get it out of there, and you're going to pay for it because you messed up. You didn't go. Now, if he had gone and it's still there, then you don't close or you don't give the seller all their proceeds. You have a hold back. 1500 bucks held back. With an addendum that says, you know, if seller doesn't get the debris removed within 15 days, you know, hold back, hold back deposit, you know, is remitted to the buyer so they can pay to get it fixed. Had another one where. You know, we have a form, right? Because we want the we want the buyer to execute. Again, it's it's people blame, like it's never their fault. It's always somebody else's fault, especially when it comes to money. So we're asking, like again, we can't make people sign. Like it's not a mandatory requirement, but we certainly like to have it in the file. So we're like, where's where's the walkthrough? And she goes, oh, you know, this is the, she was, she's my friend. That's, that's her rationale. Why she didn't go? Because it was her friend. Okay. Well, if after you close and your client goes to the property and the AC isn't working, she may not be your friend anymore. Lazy, just lazy, plain. I couldn't spend an hour to go and walk through that property to make sure everything is being turned over in good order. Think of how much work you've done. This is the final accumulation, right? It's, it's great. It's quick. 
I mean, typically you want to do it right before closing. You go to the house, you check everything out, and then off, you know, you close. All right, reviews. So reviews, referrals, they're very, very important. It's how you build your business, right? You want to pick one place, Zillow, Realtor, Yelp, right? Anywhere that's, you You know, it's difficult to ask your client to review you on more than one site. So you're going to pick one site, Zillow, Realtor, Yelp, and you're going to try to have all your, your reviews live there. And what you're hoping for and striving for is five-star reviews. You are a five-star agent. And then you want to plant that seed. Can they refer you, right? Do they know anybody looking, right? You know, my wife is a real estate agent and she doesn't do much real estate anymore, but she has a few clients that have been with her for like five or six years that actually purchase real estate. She has one family that does a lot with her. Her secret is she kind of becomes their friends. She gets like to that level with her clients. Again, you don't have to go that far, but again, you're trying to do a great job. So you get those five-star reviews and they refer you. They use you again. They're your biggest advocate. Get those reviews. It will help you. People, people check them out. You never know what people are looking at, right? To determine you're the person they want to work with. All right, everyone. <laughs> That's a lot. I know there's a lot of information I threw at you. I really appreciate everybody being here. You know, I'm going to send this deck, um, you know, first thing in the morning along with a link to tomorrow night's training. So tomorrow night's training is a whole bunch of concepts. Agency fair housing, RESPA, antitrust, seller's disclosure, lead paint, appraisal contingency. I go through the financing contingency again, right? A number of things that will strengthen you. You got to know your stuff. You got to do two things here in this business to succeed, right? You got to meet people you don't know, and you got to warm up to them, and they have to warm up to you, and then you got to be technically proficient, so we're going to help you there. And again, you're not going to know it all. You're not going to, it's not possible. But the whole thing is, oh, what did he say about that? I, I need to call support. You know, this is to jog your memory when you're out there working. We can run into some crazy situations. You know, I had one where, you know, again, I didn't know the answer to this. You know, the guy, you know, the property had been out there for a long time. And, you know, uh, he's going to give half the property. The buyer's name is going to go on the deed. She's gonna, it was like a $900,000 property. She's putting $400,000 down. She's going on the deed. And then the agent says, can I collect my commission? I'm like, okay, I think you can, but I need to call the legal hotline. And I call them and they say, absolutely. If the deed transfers in any way, right, we've earned our commission things like that. There's some good technical resource resources, the legal hotline, you know, support line through Dalton Wade, me, you know, I mean, I fielded pretty much every question, but if I'm not 100% sure, I'm going to call that legal hotline and they're going to guide me. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. I hope you picked up a few tips, feel like a little stronger agent, ready to get out there and conquer the world. Appreciate everybody being here. Thank you, Kia. Good seeing you. Andres, thank you so much. Estefina, nice seeing you. Appreciate you being here. All right, everyone. James, good seeing you again. Two nights in a row. That's awesome. I love it. All right, everyone. Thank you. Have a great night. Appreciate you being here. Hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Good evening.